Good morning. Let's just pray as we begin our time in the Word. So, Lord, we just gather before you. May you turn our hearts to have open ears for the things that you have for us this morning. May we find you lighting passion, lighting sincerity, and lighting surrender in our lives, Lord. We seek first the kingdom so that you can add everything to us. Amen. Well, this morning we bring to a close our series, Character. Throughout this series, we've been talking about some traits that should take root in us as we become followers of Jesus. And the traits that we've been exploring, by all means, are not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive list. There are other traits that are birthed in us as we follow Jesus, but I think some of the ones that we have been exploring are really important for us to learn. These traits are aspects of our character that are born in us but become developed in us the longer we follow Jesus. They should be found at the heart of who we are and the heart of who we are as a church community. The first week we looked at integrity. The second week we looked at honor. Last week we looked at what it means to be gratefully content. This morning we are going to talk about another trait a trait that should be found in the heart of who we are and in the heart of our community. For many of us, as we've said each week, as most of us think of the word character, we think of things like cartoon characters. And so each week we've looked at how the character development of one particular cartoon might have something to say to us about the development of character that we experience as followers of Jesus. First week we looked at Mickey Mouse. The second week we looked at Popeye. And last week we looked at Charlie Brown. This morning we are going to be talking about the character traits of loyalty. Now as I throughout the week began to think what character best demonstrates loyalty for us. I couldn't think of a cartoon that was overly loyal, that would sketch out for us the type of character of loyalty in which we need. But what did come to my mind was a claymation uh, series that I watched as a small kid. Uh, two characters that really demonstrated deep loyalty. The characters of Gumby and Pokey. Now, perhaps like me, you grew up watching Gumby and Pokey. Ironically, Gumby was nothing more than just this experiment of a film student in 1950 by the name of Art Clokey. He had kind of made a spoof of Disney's Fantasia with this little piece of clay uh, with this green guy that he called Gumby based on the mud that he found on his grandpa's farm and they called Gumbo. And, and he began to sketch out this character to a movie producer said, I think that would be a really good thing for kids and, and you should try to shop it around. Well, in the 1950s, there was a show many of you may be aware of called Howdy Doody. Howdy Doody ran across Gumby and, and, and thought, man, this would be something my audience would really like. And so he introduced Gumby on one of his episodes, and it was a hit. The children loved it. It wasn't long after that that Gumby began to have his own kids show. You know, shortly after launching his own show, there were other characters that were needed. This pile of green clay was not enough. And so he introduced a, a friend. Gumby had a friend that was a, a yellow dinosaur, and his name was Prickly. And then there were these guys that were kind of uh, always up to no good, and they were called the Blockheads, and they just looked like blocks. And that was like my nickname growing up for my dad, right? Hey, Blockhead. It, it all comes from Gumby. And so there was these guys that were like trying to work against Gumby. And so Gumby needed somebody who was going to be loyal to him. And Art went to his clay and began to draw up the character you see standing next to him, Pokey. Pokey was as loyal to Gumby 
as any friend could or should be. Now, if you don't know Gumby, Gumby in each episode would travel through time to learn about history. Sometimes you go back to the time of dinosaurs or to a, a president era that had already passed. And on these trips, he would run into different uh, dangers, and the blockheads would try to stand in his way. And so Gumby found deep loyalty with his pony named Pokey. In fact, their loyal friendship grew with each episode and session, uh, season, and eventually their friendship and loyalty actually became the centerpiece of the show. You and I all want that same kind of loyalty in our life. We want to experience loyalty with the person that we marry. We want to experience loyalty with our family. We want to explore and experience deep loyalty with our friends. A loyalty that transcends throughout our history and in every story, no matter what we go through. We want a loyal friendship or relationship that stands through every circumstance that comes our way. Our lives are centered around these type of relationships when we get them. I believe loyalty is a character trait that, that births in us as we become followers of Jesus, and it begins to develop in us as we follow Jesus more. We'll speak to that in a minute. This series in which we've been out, it has been a series of sketching out four traits that should define our character, both as individuals and as a church community. Now, I said loyalty is a trait that has been planted or born in us when we are transformed by Jesus. And I say that because I think we find examples of loyalty throughout the Bible. God was deeply loyal to his creation and to his people, still providing ways of reconciliation to them no matter how many times they abandoned him or walked away. Jesus was loyal to the Father in such a way that he was willing to lay down his life for the Father's children. In fact, Jesus then goes on to say that loyalty is such a love that it is shown when someone is willing to lay down their life for another. The trouble is loyalty is often harder to live out than we admit. Peter swore that he'd be loyal to Jesus through the thick and thin. In fact, when they were ready to arrest Jesus, Peter's the first one to pull out a sword and slice off an ear of a, of a guard that's coming his way, and he wants to stay loyal to Jesus at all costs. But that changes when his own life is put at risk, and he ends up denying Jesus, and the quest for loyalty ends. In Rome's history, there is a story of a slave named Spartacus. It's one of my favorite stories. It's been made into a ton of movies. It's been made into TV shows. And there's so many tales and takes on this story that it's hard to even separate what is truth from fable anymore. But at the core of this story, it is a story of deep loyalty. If you don't know who uh, Spartacus was. He was a man who was captured by Rome. He was, he was enslaved by the empire. They killed his wife and his children, and he was made to train and fight in the Colosseum games. He rose to the ranks as he became undefeatable, and the longer he lived in slavery, slavery, the more he learned to care for the slaves around him. In fact, at this time, Rome was expected to have about 10 slaves per every person, and they were not considered citizens or even human in the eyes of Rome. The longer he lived, the longer he took up the care of these other second-right citizens. Finally, Rome goes into this season of really cracking down on their slaves, and somehow Spartacus is able to overthrow his captors and makes a run for it. And he takes with him hundreds of slaves. And as time grows on and he goes into towns, he ends up taking more and more slaves. This is a true story, as I'm saying, it has earned a fable over years. But, but Spartacus runs for the better part of a year, uh, maybe more, and he's got thousands of slaves following him, and he's provided them freedom. And he's telling Rome they're not coming back until they receive dignity. 
There's a point where Rome is so embarrassed that these slaves are able to upsurf their power, their, their dignity. I mean, they have soldiers looking for them, and at every corner, these slaves are, are just embarrassing them. So they eventually send out pretty much their whole army after just a few slaves that are wandering through the winter and dying off from the cold. So what we see here in this clip is the story of Spartacus and a story of loyalty. Have we a count of prisoners? We haven't made the final count, sir. I bring a message from your master, Marcus Licinius Crassus, commander of Italy, by command of his most merciful excellency, your lives are to be spared. Slaves you were, and slaves you remain. But the terrible penalty of crucifixion has been set aside on the single condition that you identify the body or the living person of the slave called Spartacus. I'm 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 Slaves were about to be recaptured by Rome and crucified, which was the penalty for running away from their captors. They were given a chance to go back and to escape with their lives, to regain what little bit of pride and escape with their lives. All they had to do was point out to the soldiers who Spartacus was. Was he among the dead in which they had just killed? Was he still among their ranks? They didn't care if he was dead or alive. They just had to point him out. However, Spartacus, out of loyalty for his people in which he cares for, begins to step up. And he was the first one that you saw stand up. And he, he begins to say, I don't want anyone to die on my account in his mind. So he stands up and begins to say, I am Spartacus. But as he does that, out of loyalty, his friends, these people he's given dignity to, these people he's given friendship to, stand up with him and also say, no, I am Spartacus. Rome is not sure who to capture. It's a beautiful example of what it means to be loyal. We all want this kind of loyalty in our lives, even when heavy consequences are on the line. The sort of loyalty, I think, that births in us as we become followers of Jesus is this kind of loyalty to those in our lives, but I also think that it is this kind of loyalty to the mission and to the church. And I don't think often when we talk about the church, we speak to it in terms of loyalty, but rather in terms of service or responsibility. Just like in this video clip, the mission for them, freedom, this community of slaves was too important to not remain loyal to it. Christian history is full of the church stories that have experienced similar consequences. In moments like this, it's said that we find out who really is loyal to Jesus, to each other, to the church, and to the mission. Loyalty to the church and the mission is the type of character trait that in those tough times is willing to say up, stand up and say, yes, I follow Jesus, or yes, I am the church. The loyalty these slaves showed for Spartacus is the type of loyalty Jesus modeled for the church and what Peter deep down wanted to show us. One of my favorite quotes on loyalty comes from an author who writes in a Forbes magazine. He says, loyalty cannot be blueprinted. It cannot be produced on an assembly line. 
for its origin is the human heart, the center of self-respect and human dignity. That's what Spartacus showed to slave, dignity. It is a force which leaps into only when conditions are exactly right for it, and a force very sensitive to betrayal. Now, those of you who have loyalty in your relationships, you know you can't fake that kind of thing. But someone willing to stick with you through the thick and the thin, that doesn't come by chance. You can't copy and paste the idea because you like it and make it happen in your life. It is something that starts in your heart. You also know that when somebody breaks that loyalty, it's unforgivable. That's why we take vows in our weddings to death do us part, and it's why we think our friends should be with us no matter what the situation. Loyalty is defined as the state or quality of being loyal, faithfulness to commitments, faithfulness or adherence to a sovereign government, leader or cause, which feels a lot more like the loyalty feels a lot more like the loyalty of a gun to your head as Katrina sharing prophetic sharing dying life. That's what number two feels like to me. And an example of instance or faithfulness or an adherence or the like. And, and for this morning, as we talk about what it means to be loyal to each other and to the church, this is the definition we're going to be using. That it is the state or quality of being loyal. I love the idea that it's a quality of being loyal. And in the church, we symbolically represent this kind of loyalty through church membership as well as baptism. There are many examples of what loyalty should look like in our friendships. And one of the, my favorites shows up in Proverbs 18.24. It says this, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend is, who sticks closer than a brother. The kind of loyalty that Pokey modeled for Gumby, which the friends of Spartacus modeled for him. However, the church also needs to learn loyalty uh, to the church and its mission. And Tom Rayner says this, If outside forces and culture were the reasons behind declining and non-influential churches, we would likely have no churches today. The greatest periods of growth, particularly in the first century of growth, took place in adversarial cultures. We are not hindered by external forces. We are hindered by our own lack of commitment and selfishness. Or we might say, the church is hindered because so few show true loyalty to it. This morning we're going to look at one of the best examples of what loyalty looks like in the church, and it's Acts 2, 42 through 45. Most of you probably know it well. It appears in Luke's book of Acts, and it really captures this historic testimony of the church. And N.T. Wright says this about the passage we're about to read. It's often regarded as laying down the four marks of the church. The apostles' teaching, the common life of those who believe, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. These four go together. You cannot separate them one without the other, or you'll damage the whole thing. Where no attention is given to teaching and to the constant lifelong Christian learning, people quickly revert to the worldview or mindset of the surrounding culture and end, their minds, end up with their minds shaped by whatever social pressures are most persuasive with Jesus somewhere around as a pale influence or memory. The passage we're going to read teaches us what we need to be loyal to so that we don't lose who we are as the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the preaching of bread and to prayer, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, we love that. That's a beautiful example of what the church should look like. In fact, William Barclay says this about that. Real Christianity is a lovely thing. The truth is most of us would want to belong to a church that looks like that, but like Peter, when he's put to the test, uh, we find that our priorities get in the way. We find that it's harder to show loyalty to the church because we allow those other things to make Jesus nothing more than a pale influence on our lives. Loyalty to the church and to its mission, as we see in this passage, means this. It is a commitment to learning. It says that they were committed to the apostles' 
teaching, the word that is actually used there is example of doctrine. It's a, it's a Greek word that can mean doctrine. They believe that they should be committed to what they believe together. One of the critiques of the church often is that it's committed to nothing but the past. How we're to be a church, we are actually to be committed to looking and learning for the future. We should be looking forward to the future. William Barclay says that the church should not look to the sunset, but rather to the sunrise. It should look to the sunset, the ending of all things, rather than back at the sunrise. A day is wasted if we aren't loyal to learning something new about it. As we see in this passage, that loyalty to the church and its mission is a commitment to fellowship. It's this idea that they were there for each other. They were there to lift each other up. They were there to share everything together. And one theologian once said, the church is only a real church when it's a band of brothers. People should see our loyalty to each other more than they see our discord or hear our complaints. Loyalty to the church And its mission is a commitment to praying, this passage teaches. This church was loyal to praying together. They knew they couldn't do it alone. They knew they needed not only the loyalty of each other, but this loyal, sustaining presence of God and power of God. And so they always went to God together before they went out into the world. Now, loyalty to the church in this passage and its mission is also a commitment to all. The NIV uses the word all there. I think King James uses the word reverence. It's, it's this great idea that they were taken back and by surprise constantly by God. They were loyal to be taken by all and reverence of God in their community. Are we loyal to that? Do we expect on Sunday mornings that we should just continue through this tradition? Or do we expect and are we loyal to the idea that God is going to all us? In that way, the church was also committed to expectation. William Barclay, as he explains this church, says it was a church that expected things to happen. It was a loyal church to expecting God to be God. Signs and wonders were everyday stuff because they were loyal to God and in their honor for each other. We also see that loyalty to the church and its mission is a commitment to sharing. In this passage, they were deeply committed to each other and sharing everything they had. Out of loyalty for others, Christians should not bear to have too much while others have too little. Let me say that again. Christians should not bear to have too much when others around them have too little. We also see this was a church that was committed to worship. The church should never forget how to worship. We've had some powerful times of worship recently. In fact, Eugene Peterson says, the only job a pastor has of great significance is to say, come, let us worship God. Everything else is secondary. They made worship a priority in which what they were loyal to. And lastly, it was a church that was committed to joy. They were a happy church. They were a church that, it said, were full of gladness. They ate together and were glad. Our job isn't to be negative nannies, as sometimes we say, but I'm going to add glad gladiuses, right? Like, we're supposed to be full of joy. I once heard somebody say, a gloomy Christian is a contradiction. Folks, the church of Acts was not a gloomy church. It was a church of great joy. So in the back of your bulletin, I think there's five things that we can take away from this passage in this last series of what it means to really learn how to honor people and how to live into honor or, I mean, how to to be loyal to others and how to be loyal to the church. And, And that is this. We're to be loving always. We are to always be loving people. That is our first and foremost aspect of what it means to be loyal. Secondly, it means to be obligated to honest and to trust, right? Like at all costs, we need to be obligated to be honest with each other and to be able to be people who we can trust. Third, we need, excuse me, we need to yearn for commitment, right? Loyalty at its core is just commitment, a commitment of reliability. Yes, I'll be there. Yes, my yes means yes. Yes, I will do that. Yes, I will serve the church in this way. 
and not only do it out of service or because a gun is to my head, but because I have joy for it and I want people to see that. It's also an unconditional commitment to help. It desires to be a person who will not bear too much when someone around you has too little. And lastly, it's about lifting each other up. Loyalty is all about lifting each other up. As you out this week, I encourage you to write down in that box, where is it easy for you to be loyal? Is it easy for, those, for you to be loyal in this area or where people are loyal to you? And where is it where it is hard for you to be loyal? Maybe it's really easy for you to be loyal to your favorite TV show and getting home every day at 5 o'clock. Maybe it's easy for you every Black Friday to get up and, and go shopping at 5 in the morning, right? But when it comes to church, you know, you're lucky to wander in there between before 9.30. Where does your loyalty fall? Eugene Peterson, in closing, as the worship team comes forward, leaves us with this quote, then I leave it with you. People learn to shop for churches because there's no loyalty in the church. They're all consumers being attracted to one product or another. I think it's sacrilege to tell you the truth. It really is. Where does your loyalty fall? Not only to each other, but to the church. Acts 2, 42 through 47 teaches us what that looks like. I invite you to stand as we close.